um, throughout the world, um, the work that we do is very, very specialized. And so um, they have people that are specifically trained to help with that type of procedure. We actually provide the product. So my car, I've got big bags filled with pacemakers and defibrillators and stuff like that um, to be able to come and provide that for a case because hospitals can't be expected to, or most do not have either the space or the capital to keep that much on hand. It's very specific what you would need from case to case. And so we uh, come around and uh, partner up for, I think it's gonna be more efficient if I download this, huh? What do you think? I think that's probably true. Um, so we're gonna go through some, these are, uh, actually presentations that are uh, targeted at new trainees and um, field personnel uh, on kind of the basics of EP. So when we talk about EP, typically there's two subsets. There's going to be what we call devices, and then there's EP or ablative EP therapy. So treatment of uh, atrial and ventricular arrhythmias that would um, be done in the specialized cath lab, the EP lab. So, this is going to do its thing. We'll go full screen here. Big enough, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, there's going to be some stuff that I'll, I'll kind of skim through because, for the purposes of our discussion, we don't need to get into every single slide. Some of these are meant for multiple hours. So, um, and if I'm going over stuff that Tony's already covered, you guys focused mostly on devices last time, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So this will be completely non-device today. All right, so the basics of all of our studies are founded on a, an understanding of the anatomy. You guys have done a little bit of reading on cardiac anatomy, and you said you were reading Dubin, right? Uh, a little bit, yeah. The orange book is called Dubin, oh, yes. right? For everybody in the industry. Uh, yeah. That's basically the Bible of introductory uh, cardiology and electrophysiology. It's a really good tool. Mm -hmm. um, some people have some issues with it because the guy has a questionable legal history, mm -hmm. but yeah. other than that, um, you know, it's Florida. So we're gonna talk about kind of the, the fundamental components of uh, the heart, both electrically and mechanically. Uh, you can probably recognize some up here, uh, SA node, AV node, his Purkinje system. These are all conductive tissues, right? That form kind of the framework, and we'll have some pictures here. Um, so what view are we in here, first of all? We're gonna talk about both fluoroscopic and just kind of anatomical views as, um, they're all abbreviations, so what options would we have? Has anybody seen kind of x-ray or fluoro? AP, right? This is AP. On a normal person's heart, normal rotation, uh, this is AP. So what's the big red thing running from the bottom to the top with three branches at the top? It is, yep. And on the left-hand side, we have the the part that looks kind of like a seashell. Hey, guys. The part that looks kind of like a seashell is the atrium, and specifically the right atrial appendage kind of flopping over the top there. What's the blue part going in and out of it? Nope. That is blue, but not the part I'm talking about. On the far left. Straight vertical. Straight vertical? Above or below? Sorry, I don't have a laser pointer, but above and below. IVC, SVC, right? The, the CAVA system. So you have return flow coming from the head, neck, extremities, you know, arms, all coming in the top one, and obviously anything below the heart in the bottom one. Okay, so some of this is gonna be very basic. I don't need to tell you that the heart is the pump. All right, so this is kind of, you know, where is everything located? In general, we're in front of the lung plane, but not very far. So an average person's heart, uh, about the size of your two fists, uh, big dilated hearts get as much as, gosh, multiple times bigger than that. I mean, don't quote me on it. It's, it's uh, we see people with hearts that are the size of like a basketball sometimes. And so what kind of things produce uh, big dilated hearts? I mean, that's the, the result of it, right? But you basically have, um, right, so backflow in the lungs, right? High pressure, which is actually forcing open the tissue, as well as um, congenital abnormalities, which cause muscle and connective tissue disorders. So, it, you know, 
it isn't as strong enough to hold the Marfans and things like that. Uh, so we primarily in EP deal with the blue part, right? The return flow. And specifically when we're putting in, a, uh, if Tony talked about by v systems or CRT devices, what's CRT stand for? In the, in the context of an ICD, if you're gonna do a CRT system in EP, it stands for cardiac resynchronization therapy. If you see a patient, and this is, you're, you're gonna see an LV lead, a left ventricular lead that goes out lateral on an X-ray, if you see that on an X-ray, that patient is probably a heart failure patient, right? Good to know if you're looking at an AP X-ray of somebody, um, whether you're a you know general GP or an ER doc or all the way up to an EP, because you know clearly that's the height of that's it. Uh, so all of these veins, which basically parallel the arterial system in the heart, uh, return into one big drain pipe called the coronary sinus, which is going to be for EP ablations often known as God's gift to EP. A uh, couple reasons for that. One, it stays in the same place. So for our studies, it's nice to be able to put a catheter, right? A catheter is what? It's a tube, basically. A catheter is a tube. So not all catheters have wires in them. Ours are you know, specialized to contain conducting wires and electrodes to provide signals. But if you were an interventional cardiologist, would you say that a catheter was a wire? No, right? Because theirs are for plumbing. But they're catheters nonetheless, right? If it's a you know, urinary catheter, not a wire, it's a tube, okay? So all of these are tubes that are introduced through um, blood vessels. Uh, we're gonna introduce a catheter up through the IVC, which enters here, or sometimes the SVC, so the case I did this morning, we put one in from the top and two in from the bottom. Depends on how many sticks you want to put in each, in each vein on the patient. All right, general idea of the heart wall, we'll kind of skip ahead. Uh, and this is, again, pretty basic. Anything interesting that we have on here? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really big RV. And in the AP view, it's going to look bigger, right? Because the LV is a more posterior structure in that projection. But even then, they're also adding in something interesting here, which is a, oops, sorry guys. Let's go back there. What is that? I'm not sure if it's intentionally drawn in this photo or not, but you got it. It's a BSD, right? If you have that between the atrium, it's called a ASD, or some people just have um, more common is a PFO, patent foramen of valley. All right, so we're gonna skip ahead a little bit. This is kind of like, you know, fundamentals. Stop me if this is stuff that is not, you know, the path of flow of blood through the heart. Comfortable? Mm -hmm. Everybody's got that one. All right, I'm not gonna like dumb it down too much here. So something that may not be completely obvious, um, the, EKG represents the aggregate projection of all of the activity of a particular chamber. So if you think about conduction from what originates a P wave, where does it start? You got it, right? Where is it, high or low? High. So the conduction of a P wave is largely high to low, right to left, right? Because the left is activated passively from the right. Does it all happen at the same time? Do all the cells depolarize at the same time? No. And so some guys are starting, some are already finished by the time that it gets to the next part. All of that added together results in what is perceived by an antenna, an EKG leaf on the bottom, right? As an aggregate leaf.
say the lateral wall versus the septum is dramatically different or dramatically faster than how long it takes for the actual ventricular myocardium to contract. So you might as well think of it as, you know, it's basically instantaneous by comparison. Now, when we get bundle branch blocks, that's a different thing, right? So this is kind of the phases. You guys are familiar with this part, kind of? Maybe not? So this is more kind of basic cardiology. I'm gonna skip ahead into types of arrhythmias that might uh, develop. So conduction disorders. Uh, this is like Dubin fundamentals, right? If you read that book, um, this is what's called the automaticity cascade. So your sinus node beats normally, unless you're exercising, anywhere between 60 and 100. Below that, you can tend to have junctional rhythm. So skip over the atrial foci part. We're gonna ignore that for the moment. But the junction is your next fail safe. The heart has all these built-in functions because why? They were helpful in preventing previous generations before us survive to the age at which they were able to have the next generation, right? The people that weren't born with this, not so successful, right? Particularly before the age of pacemakers. So, you know, one of the reasons we have all of these backup systems is because they were evolutionarily preferred, right? If you have a different version of how that happened, you know, that's great. But the mechanism would be the same. Uh, the, uh, the ventricles then below that typically have their own what's called escape rhythm. So if you hear the, the terms escape rhythm, the physician is talking about a ventricular only rhythm. As in, either there's block above where the P waves aren't getting through, or uh, there just isn't, there aren't any P waves. So this is kind of in terms of timing when that happens. So atrium starts first, then it goes to the AV node, then it goes to the Hispurkinji system, and then later, you notice, then you get the QRS. Why is it later? What do you think? It's got to get to the antenna. So the signal actually has to depolarize the ventricular myocardium, which happens after the activating fibers, and then it gets to the antenna. So there's a latency period, right? There's a kind of, the signal's actually, you know, the contraction's actually starting here, but we don't pick it up until here. What happens in the T wave, by the way? I didn't talk about it. Yeah, repolarization. Okay, this is like below you guys, right? Kind of? You can say yeah. Okay, so we're gonna skip ahead. <laughs> All right, and I might have to skip actually to the next presentation, which is, okay. So basic EP, here is how we treat arrhythmia. Typically, you're gonna use an ablation catheter, which is a hot catheter, right? This heats up. It delivers high uh, frequency alternating current, basically, to the heart. And it does that through the tip of the catheter, which you can see on the left. There's two catheters there laying next to each other, um, which is the fat part at the end. Uh, these are typically, uh, all of these electrodes are coated with like platinum or used to be gold or something like that. Um, Non-reactive, highly conductive metals. Uh, so the tips of these things are actually worth hundreds of dollars sometimes. Um, the uh, catheters are often steerable, so you can see the physician's hand's got multiple different steering mechanisms. One that's like a butterfly, sometimes it's a push-pull, but it allows for them to deflect it back and forth to make different shapes and to deliver energy uh, in the form of RF ablation to different spots. So what you heat, you kill, you cook, right? Dead meat don't beat. Once you give a scar in that area, the idea is that if it's an effective scar, and you deliver long enough, you kill that area of the heart. So ablation is fundamentally a destructive act. It's where we're at right now, right? Someday stem cells will make all of this seem like, you know, leeches, but this is where we're at. So we have different types of catheters. Uh, 
in addition to ablation catheters, there's mapping catheters. And this is one of the types of mapping catheters we might use. This is called a spiral or a loop catheter. The idea of this is to be able to drive around inside the chamber of the heart and collect geometry. So you can see on the right hand side, this is a screen from one of our mapping systems uh, that shows, this is a very basic one, this is like 10 years old. Um, it looks way nicer than this today. And maybe I'll show you one of those pictures. Um, but this is, what chamber do you think this is by the way? Left one? Close. Atrium. Go up. Yeah, it's the left atrium. So this is a PA view of the left atrium. The hint basically is you're never going to put a loof catheter in the V. And the reason is because this shape is really good at catching valve leaflets and little chordae tendinae. So they only put these in the atrium. Uh, you would do this by doing a transeptal puncture. So you come up from the IVC, which is over here, come into the right atrium across the septum, and then you drive around inside this chamber. And these are your pulmonary veins. So right now we have left superior, left inferior, right superior, right inferior, and what's that thing sticking out the front? What else is in the left atrium? It's a big magnet for clots, usually. It is, you got it, yep. The appendage is like the cul-de-sac of the heart. Right? It's this little floppy area. Um, in terms of evolutionary significance, I'm actually not sure. I mean, it, it's one of the, um, the things that kind of, uh, I believe that develops and closes off during field development. I admit this is a weak part of my understanding, um, but it doesn't have really a, like a functional part in terms of blood flow, right? Because it is a dead end. But it, what, what it is really good at is collecting blood and allowing it to clot inside it. And so there's a lot of uh, therapies now that are designed at closing this guy off, right? So the Watchmen, uh, the Amplats are plugged, they're different names for different brands. But basically they, they go from the inside or the outside and they actually close this off so that blood can go in there, it can clot, but it ain't coming out. Lots of different shapes. Um, these are named after different doctors. So this is Dr. Cornond, Dr. Josephson, Dr. I forget what this is called. Uh, no, it's um, crap. Uh, no, they're abbreviations. Um, this is Dr. Straight. Uh, <laughs> But you can see this is another loop catheter we might use. Um, they're, they're typically named by, you know, the number of electrodes on them. So you see the little metal parts here. Each one of these is capable of collecting a signal from the endocardium. And we use that to help determine, okay, how much voltage is there? Who's happening first or last, right? So activation sequence is very important for understanding how arrhythmias are, are happening. Um, and then if it had an ablation tip on it too, we would use that to deliver heat. Yes? Are there any ones that like are straight when you insert and then when you're where you are, it curves? Absolutely. So steerable catheters have pole wires inside of them. So that ablation catheter I was showing, those are all steerable. You're all, always going to have a steerable ablation catheter because you want to move it around. These are often designed for um, different locations physiologically. So what do you think the CS catheter goes into? Coronary You got it. Uh, Cornons and Josephsons are often designed for either the right atrium, the HIS, right? That's the that's our term for the, the AV node signal, right? That's the name of the AV node signal. The compact AV node is called the HIS. It's a little spike in between the A and the V. And uh, the V. So I said A, V, and S, right? Um, these are only going to go where they're shaped to go. So sometimes it requires a little maneuvering in order to, since you can't, um, you can't steer it very well. So these are all the places that you can do ablation access, right? You can put a catheter in. Which of these do you think is the most common? Cephalic. Nope. Cephalic is going to be for devices. Yeah. Yeah. So the femoral veins is the most common. Um, as well as in the cath lab when they do interventions, that's where they're going to go the most common. Whether it's not it's a diagnostic or a therapeutic catheterization, they're going to go through those. On little kids, they often do brachials, 
So if you work in a children's lab, they do much more access through the arms. Um, that's a good question, and I don't have a succinct answer. I'm not sure if it's the development of, um, you know, size-wise, or if they're they're looking not to scar their femoral veins because of development happening afterwards. I'll, I'll, we'll get an answer on that. I don't know. Uh, jugular. Sometimes we did one of those this morning. Um, just depends on what the physician's preference for access is. Jugular is a straight shot. Right, it's a stick in the neck, but you know, often central lines are going to be placed right either through subclavian or jugular access. All right, so we put a catheter at the high right atrium. Here's what it looks like. You get a spike. Remember, I said it's very localized here. It's very discrete signal compared to a big wide thing. So it happens at the beginning of the P wave, before the P wave. That's where this guy is going to be. So where do you think the hiss is going to be? If this is at the P wave, where do you think the AV node signal is going to go? Because that's this next catheter right here. Well, how about this one? This is the V. Where's that going to be, time-wise? So you got a spike here for the A. Where's the V going to be? It's going to be right before the QRS, right? just before the onset. So where's the hiss? Somewhere in the middle, yeah. So in a normal sinus rhythm, endocardial tracing, you're gonna have A, then, oh, okay, the next one is gonna say hiss, there it is, right there. Little signal, and V. Turns out we were able to see the V on the hiss catheter. That's very common, right? Because it's a tiny thing and you're gonna sometimes see all three, A, hiss, V. So let's go back. So, what's the top structure here? What's this hole? SBC, yep. And then this is a, they're showing the, the SA node location. Uh, and then so where's the HR catheter, HRA catheter located? Yeah, it's at the junction, right? In between. So you can see on this one too, right? A comes at the beginning of the P wave. If you were to put a catheter over where my mouse is, what do you think, knowing what you know about how P wave works, where would that be? Time-wise, on this endocardial tracing. It would go much more to the right. It would be at the end of the P wave, right? Because that's the last part of the atrium that's, whatever the last atrial tissue, right? That's gonna be your end of your P wave. So if it's sinus rhythm, right to left, it goes down. All right, so this is our what? Right here. AV note. AV note, compact AV note, yep. And then below it, this is our what? This whole big flat disc going across. Nope, that's this one. What's this? What separates the A and the V? It is an electrically isolated structure. It is not conductive. Try, it is. Try, 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 try it's a it's a structure that holds the valves. You know what it's called? Trigome. Kind. Of, you're close. Fibrous trigome is part of the septal structure of this. <laughs> it's fibrous. Nope. That holds onto the valves. This is called the valve annulus. The annulus is the edge of a ring. They're pointing to the tricuspid valve. This is the annulus across here. So what's, what valve would this be, separating the LA and the LV? Mitral, yeah. That part's basic, sorry. Okay, so here's what a basic study looks like on Flora. This view is designed to provide you a shotgun barrel view down that valve plane. So you have the tricuspid valve on the left and the mitral valve on the right, and we have couple catheters here. So we've got one, two, three, and then one more up here. Where's this catheter coming in from? These are coming in from the groin. That's easy. IVC. All the way down to the femoral stick. What's this coming from? It is. Or potentially the subclavian stick, right? Either one of those. 
a superior access point. Right? So reviewing kind of what we just looked at, we've got our HRA catheter, our HIS catheter, our V catheter, and our CS. Notice how much more lateral the CS is. Right? The CS is a left-sided structure. It separates your left atrium and your left ventricle. The really nice thing, we said this is God's gift to EP, uh, you get to have both signals often. So you get to see both the A and the V on one catheter and have it never move. Right? As long as it doesn't slide out, this isn't going to translate inside the heart. Right? By translate, I mean up, down, left, right. All these other catheters are floating around. The CS is in a tube. It ain't going anywhere, which is really nice for our reference purposes because these rings are not drawn in real life, right? We don't, you can't see the valves, unless they have a prosthetic valve. So, here's what it looks like from the CS. You get both A, and notice this A is later. Why? Why is the A later on the left? Further from what? You're right. Just get to the next part, yeah. So where does a P wave start? It does. So are you closer or farther from the SA node? You got it. It has to conduct farther, right? It has to travel farther. And so you can see it traveling from the right atrium, and then this is in the proximal CS, which means you're closer to the right side. You're kind of in the septum here. And then you get farther away to the left, and it goes later, right? So it's propagating from the septum on the left side all the way over to the lateral right, uh, left atrium. Same thing here, right? Right to left, right? Same thing. So uh, what else do we get here? We've got a hiss signal-ish. It's a pretty crappy hiss, right? It's like that thing right there. That's the AV node. And then what's this? You can see it from the hiss, and you can also see it. So this is sitting at the valve. It's across the valve, so it's picking up the node, and it's also picking up what? Look up. What's this? Whenever you come into a cath, cath lab or an EP study, right? If you're, if you're, you're going to be lost looking at these signals to start, because there's a lot of information to process. But if you're lost as to what's happening, look up to the EKG, right? Because that's kind of the story of what's going on. So what's that? It is. So this is the, the beating of the ventricles. So what is this probably? We have the AV node here. It goes A, H, what? V. V. Endocardially, we call this the V, right? Rather than like the P or the R. The R is up here, the V is down here, endocardially. Same thing here. What are we seeing on the CS? A and V. Yeah, pretty useful thing to be able to see both of those on one catheter and have it stay put. And then this one we know is in the V, right? So that's also almost cheating. It's like, if there's a signal here, it better be the V because this is sitting in the right ventricle. We're not gonna go through 230 slides, don't worry. Okay, so this is kind of another kind of condensed version. So what valve, we already covered that part is, what's the valve that it's pointing to? Mitral valve, yep. And that catheter is sitting where? Yeah, it's sitting in the, in the coronary side. It's not very well drawn, I'll be honest. It could be better, it could be better along the valve annulus. Usually this rides exactly along the valve annulus. Okay. And then, obviously, the V comes at the beginning of the QRS. Okay. All right, let's skip ahead a little bit. Let's see what else we got. Again, normal conduction. High to low, right to left. If it ain't working that way, you got a problem. So why is this image, this is the exact same catheter setup we looked at on the previous fluoro image, but why does it look different now? This is covering a little bit of fluoro views. Sorry? Yeah, what, which one? Right. Yeah, right? This is right anterior oblique. So this is the football view of the heart, the long axis view. You've got the shotgun view, that's LAO, and the football view, which is long. It stretches everything out. A is on the left and V is on the right. So where's the, say, apex of the heart now? 
Yeah, bottom right, right? Where's the base of the heart? Yeah, it's right here. Right? Atria, base, and the valve plane, conveniently enough, is marked by both the coronary sinus and on the right side, the his catheter provided sitting at the valve, right? So we're looking in profile at the valve. It's in it's like, you know, the wafer, we're looking at the edge. Um, in terms of floral views, and we don't have to make this all about floral views today, but um, another good way to know this, right, is the heart is on what side of the spine? Here. It's on the anatomic left, right? So think about where the, that puts the camera, right? That puts the camera over here. We, the camera, by the way, if you're thinking about a floral monitor, it's not always obvious because radiation is actually traveling from the emitter to the receiver. The receiver is actually on top of the patient, but from the purposes of viewing, it is the viewer in your image. It is the eyes or the camera. Uh, it's also called the image intensifier, or the II, or sometimes it's called the flat detector. But the part on top is the receiver where the radiation comes. It comes from the bottom, right up. All right, so when you're getting shielded from radiation, right, it's kind of important to block the stuff coming up at you. Okay, uh, and this is a kind of a physiologic equivalent of what we just looked at. All right, so if you overlay this on this, the his catheter is coming across here into the RV. The RV catheter is sitting down here in the trabeculation at the bottom of the chamber. HRA catheter was sitting up there. This patient has a what? PFO. They do. Yeah, I assume so. That looks like the way it's drawn. Right, this PFO. Did oh. you say to get to the left atrium, you go actually through the you do, yeah. If they have a really big PFO, they'll just go through that. But sometimes, depending on what they want to do, they'll still do a puncture. And there's a couple reasons. Um, often, to get to certain structures, the PFO is not in the right place. Um, it, I guess that's kind of a big reason. Um, do you have to repair that when you repair No. Uh, no, because the repair would be a really significant structural heart surgery to pop in a plug. Um, if the patient has sim is symptomatic to their PFO, um, aka a they have like a left to right shunt, um, or we're concerned about clotting risk, uh, then yeah, they'll do a they'll do a repair. And there's there's quite a few people out there I've heard, at least anecdotally, that will have these things put in um, because they're just worried. It's almost like a cosmetic internal thing. Um, but most PFOs go unrepaired. They just right people are. They don't have any symptoms as a result of it. So uh, for like a cryo balloon where we're putting a really big sheath through that septum, even then, they they either uh, close up on their own or the significance of that hole is pretty pretty minor. So no, they don't they don't bother to close it. Okay, what do you do in the EP lab? I'm not entirely sure what the significance of it is, but you know. All right, it's obviously metaphor here. Is this the space? Shuttle? Is that what I'm looking at? Concord, maybe? I don't know what that is. Yeah, I would think Concord, maybe. It's kind of wide, but. All right. So, kind of some basic uh, terms and definitions that we have been using a little bit. Uh, antigrade, retrograde. So, something going forward from the A to the V is integrate, right? Uh, Retrograde backwards. Uh, to decrement is to reduce. Increment is to increase. When we give a drive train, it's basically an equally spaced sequence of artificial beats. Um, actually, we can cover these in a bit. We know about winky bocking, right? It's one of the types of what? It's, AV it's one of the types of AV blocks, right? It's the type one or Mobitz type one. There's different conventions for how they're naming them now. I've noticed, but um, to Winky Bach basically means that you're getting it's like short, longer, longer drop, short, longer, longer drop. Uh, and we'll cover other things when we get to them. Okay, so typically physicians will use a worksheet like this. These are really helpful if you're going to be in a lab um, to just kind of keep track of what's going on. Uh, this again shows your kind of refractory periods and other things. A lot of the, a lot of EP labs they'll have this on the bench.
apparently that one is designed to be printed out. Okay, so PR, QRS, QT interval, I don't need to go over all that stuff, obviously. So here's how ultimately all those signals look on an EP view. This goes up on something called the recording system, which takes all those signals, collects them through their pin blocks, right? They come from the catheters, they get routed through a, an amplifier system and then put up there. And so these measurements can be made relatively quickly using a mouse and keyboard. Um, and either the electrophysiologist himself will do this, or sometimes I do this, or sometimes a technician that works for the hospital does this. It just depends on kind of how things are set up and who knows how to do what. Um, but they'll do what's called baseline measurements. Baseline measurements in sinus uh, are going to allow the physician to understand the behaviors of like, okay, how fast do they go? How do they conduct? Do they have a really long age? Do they have a really short you know, conduction time? Uh, at the end, if we damage something, can we show what that is? Um, or if we improve something? Uh, so all of that's going to get recorded at the beginning. Let's get that a little bit. All right, so I think we'll skip to a couple of arrhythmias here. So let's do and I'm trying to think, have we covered any of these in my prior times I've been here? Mm -hmm. I think it was a flutter I mean, RT. It was, it was all device based, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start with kind of the basic ones. Flutter. Okay. So atrial flutter is something you've probably seen from an EKG perspective, but from an inside the heart and treatment perspective, it's going to look a little different. So what does atrial flutter look like on EKG? Sawtooth. Sawtooth, right? The reason for the sawtooth is not only because it's going in a nice smooth wave, but also because it's continuous. There is no pause in between beats. It's always going. And so that sawtooth, it's not like there's like a beat, pause, beat, pause, beat, pause. No, it's always going. The direction changes because it's going away from or toward the antenna, but the fact that there is always a continuous uh, conduction is kind of the signature of atrial flutter. This is kind of its, you know, clinical signific significance. It's common, often occurs with AF, sometimes triggers AF. Uh, people can be completely asymptomatic or sometimes um, like cripplingly so. It just depends on how they, uh, you know, other comorbidities, how their heart function is working otherwise. As you can see, if they have baseline left ventricular uh, dysfunction, that would make a difference. Why is why LV dysfunction? Why is that the important part here? If something's wrong with your LV and the pump doesn't work great in the first place and you add another rhythmic problem, they're saying you, you get symptoms. So why is the LV fundamentally more important. It's the main pump out to the body. Yeah, it's the big one, right? It goes to the brain and the body. Mm -hmm. So if you have LV dysfunction, you have a much bigger problem um, than reduced uh, output from the right. Right? You're still going to have a problem, but... Okay, so this is a nice 1980s photo of uh, <laughs> what it's like. Believe it or not, they still have that EKG machine in half of the offices in LA. Uh, that just shows basically how they, uh, how to do the tracing. So there are ways to treat it. Um, you can shock the patient out, which is called the cardioversion. Uh, this has much the same sort of, uh, philosophy, electrically speaking, as a, um, as a rescue shock for VTVF, because you resynchronize the beating of all of the cells at the same time get them all back to phase zero, and they all start off at the same time. So if they're out of sync, you basically resync them. You can also chemically cardiovert them with something called ibutylide. Uh, other things that are important when you're considering this, when you're in AFib or a flutter, 
particularly a fib, your risk for clotting goes up dramatically. You can think of this as like the difference between a smooth channel, right, a canal with water flowing through it, or rapids. When, and think, because blood is now flowing through this, if you're going smoothly, you're not gonna bump into anything. There's much less chance of lacerating open those cells and activating the clotting response. But if you go through rapids, not so much. If you stagnate, even worse. And so ATAF results in stagnation in places like the left atrial appendage that then produces clot. So you can also slow down their ventricular rate. If the patient can't have an ablation, we're gonna get to like, this is what we do, right? So we're gonna talk about ablation. But for patients that can't have ablation, um, sometimes they slow their rate in a flutter or a AFib um, with uh, nodal blockers. So why, why by making the nodes slower, what's that gonna do? You got it, right? Chemically, you're, you're prolonging the refractory periods of the AV node, and you get fewer impulses that are gonna travel through to the ventricles. Often, when that happens, you need a pacemaker because it's really hard to get this just right so that they go slow enough to feel not like they're racing, but also fast enough to be able to do their normal functions. So common treatment for patients with AFib or flutter that couldn't be treated before was beta blocker and pacemaker. So you bring them down, but not too low. All right, so how do we treat it now? Largely with an ablation. So that's the catheter up here. This is what it looks like. This one happens to have irrigation through it. So that's why you see the droplets. So here's what it looks like. Cycle lengths between 190 and 250. You're familiar with looking at things in cycle length, kind of, a little bit. So the cycle length is you, the difference between rate and interval. They are reciprocals. So in this case, the faster the rate, the shorter the interval, and likewise the opposite. So the longer the interval, the slower the rate. Uh, we call it the, uh, the cycle length. So basically the, the time between beats. And in this case, you can see in flutter here and flutter here, you've got that nice sawtooth pattern. Constant depolarization all the way around. So between those, uh, counterclockwise is much more, more common. It has to do with the way that refractory periods and conduction happens in the right atrium. Um, usually additional beats happen to come um, in such a way that it starts up the septum easier than it goes down the septum. So. Oh, and uh, it gets to the V typically in multiples. Because it's so regular, the, the node responds in a regular way. So rather than, you know, winky bocking in flutter, you almost always will have Mobitz type two of some ratio. So three to one, four to one, six to one, things like that. Okay. So this is just kind of the internal mechanism of how it looks. We'll cover that a bit later. Uh, basically it's a big loop. So let's see if we have, is this what, what a video? Guess not. So this catheter is in the right atrium. Uh, it's going up the septum, across the ceiling, and down the lateral wall. What separates the valve from the IVC? Do we have our model in here somewhere? structure here for us, because we've got this big loop, is going to be, we want to cut the shortest, easiest part, right? Because we're lazy and we want to move on to the next patient so we can make more money. We also want it to be effective, right? We don't want to have to go somewhere where it's going to reheal much easier. So the lazy part was only half true. So here's